He started off as an outcast. When I was hired as a planner, no one else was called that. Back then, it wasn't easy for me to fit into a group. People sort of accused and attacked me as being this guy that didn't have any technological skills. Whose ideas were far ahead of their time. I would think that a video game idea like that, where you don't kill anybody, I think that was probably a tough sell for Hideo you know, Kojima. I know a lot of people complained that there was too much dialogue in the game, but the dialogue was, you know, a little bit cheesy. It was just getting very frustrating and tough for me. I began thinking about leaving the company. But Hideo Kojima's ideas will create one of the greatest gaming series of all time. The whole industry is still reeling from the impact that Metal Gear Solid has done for the video game industry. He is an icon, there's no question. What comes from this point onwards is just going to be amazing. This is the story of Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid franchise. It's the turbulent 60s when a man named Hideo Kojima is born. I was born in Tokyo in 1963 and lived there up until I was three. And then I moved to Western Japan and that's where I grew up. He is introduced to the silver screen early in life. When I was a baby boy, I was forced by my parents to watch films even before I knew who I was. So I grew up on movies. While Kojima is studying economics in college, he discovers a new love. I had a lot of free time, and that's when I started playing video games. Namely, games on the Famicom. The game that changed my life, the game of my destiny, was Shigeru Miyamoto's Super Mario Brothers. Super Mario Brothers. Till then, I pretty much had the notion that film and video games were separate entities. But then, I realized that even in video games, I could do creative things just like they're done in the movies. He has such a great mind for storytelling that I just think that his mind's always going and he's always taking everything in and analyzing it and thinking of ways he can use that in a story. Kojima decides to pursue a career in the game industry, much to the surprise of his friends. I was part of an economic seminar during my fourth year in college when I told my professor and colleagues that I was going to join the video game industry. They told me, no way, stop and think twice about what you're doing. I joined Konami in 1986. But the aspiring game designer has some problems fitting in at first. Everyone sort of did everything back then. And when I was hired as a planner, no one else was called that. Back then, it wasn't easy for me to fit into a group. People sort of accused and attacked me as being this guy that didn't have any technological skills. His first project is a near disaster. I was given this particular game plan, and I worked on it for six months. But the thing was, I didn't know anything about memory space in a game or the actual method of how to assemble a game and put together a game. I never thought about the actual schedule or timeline of when to do what. Then my boss called me and said, sorry, they were dropping my game plan. And this was my first big challenge. I was the only one in the company who had never had any of his games released. And people, instead of saying, hi, would come and say, at least complete one game before you die. Kojima is given one more chance. After the game was dropped, the company came to me and told me to create a combat game based on war. If I were to work on a game based on war, I wanted to do something more like The Great Escape, where you actually run away instead of shoot. When I came up with this game plan, my superiors in the company said, this rookie's already failed on one project, and now he's trying to come up with this weird concept where you don't fight, but you run away. I would think that trying to sell a video game idea like that where you don't kill anybody and you are, you know, in stealth mode the whole time, I think that was probably a tough sell for Hideo Kojima at first. Near the end of the year, it was just getting very frustrating and tough for me. I began thinking about leaving the company, and I talked to one of my superiors. He helped me and gave me some advice, and eventually it all worked out in the end, I guess, with Metal Gear. Kojima comes up with the idea of a stealth action game where players take the role of Solid Snake, a special forces operative who must defeat a walking nuclear tank called Metal Gear. After two or three months of development, the game started moving. The game system was ready, and you could actually sneak around your character. And if the enemy saw you, you'd get the exclamation point above your head, and they'd start attacking you. When we got to this point, the team members played it, and they said, oh my god, this could be a great game. And from then on, development went really smooth. Konami begins to warm up to Kojima's unique new game. But how will the public react?
After a long, hard road, Kojima releases his first game in 1987, Metal Gear. The game was for the MSX system. It wasn't a big market, but when the game came out, it was really well received and was ranked like number one or two among all consumer software games in the adventure or RPG categories. In 1988, Metal Gear makes its way to the U.S. on the NES. Metal Gear was uh, very different from all of the games that were popular on the Famicom at that time because it was not a run-and-gun, all-out action game. Since the MSX game of Metal Gear was very well received, Konami decided to port the game to the NES, and they got a completely different team to create the NES version of the game. It probably sold over a million copies in the U.S. It's no surprise that Konami asks for a sequel. And since the NES version of Metal Gear sold so well in the US, the sales force in the US said, please, do a sequel. They started working on a sequel, and that was Snake's Revenge. First of all, I did not work on either version of the two NES games at all. So what they ended up producing was a game that was completely different. Uh, it was called Metal Gear 2 Snake's Revenge. The problem, of course, with this is that people who liked Metal Gear would play this and say, what the heck is this? This isn't Metal Gear. This is just an action game. So that was kind of disappointing. Snake's Revenge is not part of the official Metal Gear timeline. This guy I met on the train from the company said, Kojima-san, I worked on Snake's Revenge, and I'm personally a big fan of your original game. I'd like to see a sequel to Metal Gear done by the real creator, Mr. Kojima. When he said that to me, the idea got into my head and I started thinking about a real sequel to the game. By the time I got off the train and went home, the entire storyline was fixed in my mind. So I went to my boss at Konami the next day with a game plan, and he said, yes, let's give it a go. The only uh, Metal Gear game that was not released in the United States yet was Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, and this only appeared on the MSX system. Metal Gear 2 was released in 1990. After that, I started working on Police Knots. That's when I started hearing rumors about the PlayStation. In 1995, Sony gives birth to the 32-bit era by introducing the PlayStation. The powerful new system catches Kojima's eye. When I saw how advanced these new systems coming out were, I started thinking about a new action game. Kojima decides to revisit the Metal Gear franchise. We established this company called Konami Computer Entertainment Japan in 1996 in Tokyo in order to develop Metal Gear Solid for the PlayStation. The PlayStation allowed me to do more things that I wanted to do for the whole infiltration experience. Since what I wanted to do was in 3D, I used these polygons to create a 3D environment. To ensure Metal Gear Solid has a unique look, Kojima brings aboard a rookie designer named Yoji Shinkawa to create an unforgettable cast of characters. Mr. Kojima interviewed me and said, I'm now working on the Metal Gear project. Would you like to come and work for me? I said, why not? Sure. So Metal Gear Solid happened to be the first game I worked on. When we talk about the Metal Gear series, you also have to talk about Yoji Shinkawa. He really created the atmosphere of the, of the world and the really memorable characters. There's so many characters. Meryl was a really interesting character. It was really neat to see Kojima put that feminine element into the game. And I thought that it was a really great way to tell a love story while you're playing through all this action. This is no time to try and hit on me, Snake. Sniper Wolf was a great character as well. He gives all his characters a heart and a purpose, and you understand why they're doing the things that they're doing. Catch you later, Ansel. And the profound, twisted nature of the characters. They have problems, and some of them have sexual problems. This is the greatest handgun ever made. And some of them are absolutely nuts. I am losing myself. Solid Snake gets a new look as well. I tried to make Solid Snake as colorless as possible. If he has too many of his own characteristics, then the player won't be able to associate himself or herself to the character. I actually did not think about color at all. I basically just wanted to recreate Solid Snake from the MSX series in my own way. I wanted to digest him and then spit out this new Solid Snake. Kojima is now ready to update the stealth action gameplay Metal Gear is known for. Little does he know that what he does will revolutionize gaming. By 1996, the PlayStation has ushered in a new era of 3D gaming. Kojima takes stealth action gameplay to the next level with Metal Gear Solid. Oh, 
I think certainly the stealth element is the biggest influence on all video games today from Metal Gear Solid and hiding behind walls. I mean, it's almost like if you're playing a game today and your character doesn't suck himself against the wall, then something's missing. You know, you gotta have that stealth element. It really defined the stealth genre. Since the game was such a hit, there was such a huge influx of stealth titles. I still think Metal Gear does the best. The tension when you're creeping around and you know there's a guard or somebody that's out, you know, looking for you and you are trying to be so careful. Theoretically, I believe, apart from the bosses, you can get through the whole game without killing anybody except for the six main people that you've gone in to get. So I thought that was interesting from a gameplay perspective, but I also thought it was interesting from a morality perspective. And Kojima pushes the boundaries of game design by breaking through the fourth wall. Put your controller on the floor. I think what Hideo Kojima did with uh, Metal Gear Solid was uh, kind of take the gamer out of the game itself. Uh, when Psycho Mantis is talking to you and your controller is rumbling, or when he knows all the Konami games that you've played on the memory save, it, it takes you out of the game a moment. And you're like, wow, this is this is one heck of a game. You know, that are, it can tell like what I'm playing, and uh, and it's taking you out of the you know just a little bit out of the game, and then it throws you right back into it. The moment where you realize you have to unplug the controller, that for me was just like, wow, that was incredible one of the pinnacle moments in gaming, for sure. Metal Gear Solid is unveiled to the masses at E3 in 1997. All we did was show a trailer, and what happened was the same people that were there in the morning at E3 were there in the evening. They were just watching it all day long. People were familiar with the Metal Gear series from the NES days. It was bringing that into a 3D form. People were hooting and hollering. I mean, it was a totally different uh, reaction than what people usually had when they saw a video game on the big screen. I mean, they weren't even playing it. I mean, this is a, this is a video and people were going crazy over it. Metal Gear Solid follows Snick's mission to stop a band of genetically enhanced terrorists who have taken over a nuclear weapons facility in Alaska. Well, Kojima's work is entirely visionary in that he doesn't follow the rules of what video games are supposed to be. And when he takes a, a game and turns it into a so-called cinematic experience, he doesn't turn it into what he thinks a movie should be either. I think he creates a perfect sort of hybrid. It was basically the movie-like presentation of Metal Gear Solid that really took people aback. When you first turned on the game, and it looked like the intro to a movie, and he's swimming around, and the credits are showing, and then he gets out, and all of a sudden there's gameplay for a little bit, and you're introduced to the stealth element of it. You run into the elevator, and then as soon as you run in the elevator, the credits start rolling again, and he's pulling off his, you know, sub gear and everything, and, you know, chills are just going up and down your spine, and you're like, man, I'm, I'm ready to roll with this game. The masses finally get their hands on Metal Gear Solid in September 1998. Kojima's game turns the industry upside down. 350,000 copies are sold in its first weekend. It will go on to sell 6 million copies worldwide. When you have a great director take on a movie, you know, it really has that tone to it. When Quentin Tarantino does a movie, it has that tone to it. Well, when Hideo Kojima does a game, you feel it. I mean, he has a very specific view of storytelling and gameplay and, and how those two should, should interact. I knew that there wasn't anything like it, and I knew that if we did it well, it would be huge. They put in so much stuff in that game. There was humor. It's like one of my Japanese animes. There was seriousness and there was drama that uh, it, was, it was definitely more than a video game experience. In a way, the first Metal Gear Solid was like the first Matrix. People didn't really know what it was like, and people really didn't care about it. But once it came out, people loved it. Metal Gear Solid thrust Kojima and Konami into the limelight. But how long will the fame and fortune last? After the release of Metal Gear Solid in 1998, Kojima and his team of talented developers begin work on Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty. After the success of Metal Gear Solid, we knew that people expected a lot from the sequel. So I was constantly under this pressure to do something great. So it was definitely a different experience. By now, Solid Snake, the game's main character, is nearly a household name. Well, Solid Snake is this uh, kind of loner, assassin type character that you know maybe that's why i like him so much he seems to have this mysterious you know he's got a very male testosterone mystique about him and i guess i find that very attractive by being that mysterious he he you really want to delve into that personality and i think that's uh 
What makes him such a cool character? You know, and the voice. How you doing, kid? Well, Solid Snake is a guy who has been used all of his life by the military and by his superiors. He's the ultimate soldier. Konami releases the PlayStation 2 version of Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty in the fall of 2001. The game includes plenty of improvements to the Metal Gear formula, as well as a soundtrack by Hollywood composer Harry Gregson Williams. Other things in the game that people found out was the first-person shooter mode. It created a new way to look at Metal Gear Solid, and you really were even impressed by the physics of the game. It was just a whole new thing, and it uh, took Metal Gear to a whole new level. But the new sequel has a big secret that catches many gamers off guard. I was in love with the game the first, you know, the first couple of chapters, I guess you'd call them, and you're playing through as Snake, and it was just incredible. But then suddenly you're playing as this Raiden character, and you're like, what is this? We're Snake. I think a lot of people were disappointed that you were an um, alternate character, Raiden. I, I think it made a lot of hardcore fans maybe unhappy. Once again, Kojima gives his game a very cinematic feel, but some gamers think it goes a little too far. You passed with flying colors. Sons of Liberty had lots of lots of movie footage, lots of lots of stuff to watch, and, and you put the controller down for literally 20 minutes sometimes. I know a lot of people complained that there was too much dialogue in the game, that the dialogue was, you know, a little bit cheesy. <laughs> Leave it to me. Despite what a lot of people said about too much cinematics and a difficult to follow storyline, I still loved it. Metal Gear Solid 2 is a hit and sells 7 million copies. In 2002, Konami releases an enhanced version of their new sequel called Metal Gear Solid 2 Substance for the PC, PS2, and Xbox. And in 2004, Konami releases a remake of the original Metal Gear Solid for the GameCube titled Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes. Well, the Twin Snakes game only was released on the GameCube, but it is based on the first game that came out on the PlayStation. It was also kind of a, a shaking of hands of two great developers, Miyamoto and Kojima. Apparently, according to the story, they were eating dinner one night, and uh, Miyamoto said, hey, why don't you make Metal Gear for the GameCube? And the suggestion was as simple as that, and they went forward with it. Then they contacted Silicon Knights, the creators of Eternal Darkness, and obviously they were more than happy to work on the game. The remake updates the gameplay, and a renowned Japanese director is brought in to redo the classic cutscenes. My name is Ryuhei Tamura. The way that uh, Kid Morrison reintroduced and retold the story from just a cinematic standpoint, I think worked really well. The idea of incorporating all the Metal Gear Solid 2 uh, gameplay into the original Metal Gear Solid game uh, really worked well too. Meanwhile, Kojima works Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater for the PS2, a prequel to the Metal Gear series. Metal Gear Solid 3 is taking things to a whole other level. I think Kojima is really challenging himself with outdoor environments. Um, you know, doing stealth, but doing it in a much different way than in these enclosed environments. I think it's going to be a really cool opportunity to try out some new things. This is a trilogy bound by one grand theme. In order to put an end to the series, you're basically eating up the snake in this game. That's why I called it Snake Eater. Today, the Metal Gear Solid series has countless imitators. There's been a, like a tremendous amount of copycat games, are, are games that are almost identical or some sort of mixtures and, and mergers of other sort of genres, but mostly have a stealth aspect to it. So people can imitate my games, and if what they come up with is enjoyable, I think that that's fine. And in 2002, the man who was once ridiculed by his fellow game developers is named one of the top innovators of the year by Newsweek magazine. Hi, everyone. <laughs> when I got the first notice or offer for that article in the magazine, I thought it was about the 10 biggest people in the video game industry. And then it turned out it was the 10 biggest people who would be shaping the world. I was surprised. The biggest change probably was within my family and among my community. My friends, many of these people say, are you ever going to stop working on video games? Aren't you going to start moving on? Then when they saw this article, they went, oh, maybe he's actually doing something he should be doing. But fans of Kojima and his Metal Gear series have always known that he was destined for greatness. Tonight, we honor the creator of the fantastic Metal Gear franchise, Hideo Kojima. He is an icon, there's no question. Um, but beyond that, I think he's got a lot more stories to tell, and, and you know, I'm one of the people waiting to hear his next story. And I still think, even today, the whole industry is still reeling from the uh, 
the impact that Metal Gear Solid has done for the video game industry. I always told myself I'd always be in the front line creating video games, even when I reached 100. Now that's changed to even after I die, even as a ghost, I'd still like to create games. It's so fun. The Japanese are not really good at expressing their thoughts with words, but I guess if I were to put it into simple words, I just love creating video games. One point two megapixel camera and holds five thousand MP3s. Wow, that's that's really impressive. Mm. Oh. Hold on a second, sorry. Hello. Yeah, hey, I'm in the middle of lunch. Uh, can I call you back? All right, cool, thanks. So that's a lot of MP3s. Yeah. Mm. See the best, greatest, biggest, shiniest, coolest, and blinkiest new stuff coming next year when the Screensavers goes live at the Consumer Electronics Show January 6th and 7th at 7 Eastern. Hold on, let me, let me put you on speakerphone.